Welcome, everyone. And before we begin, uh, we would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territory of the indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. And we thank them for allowing us to meet and to learn on their territories. Uh, the original, to, to the original caretakers of this land on which we stand, we acknowledge the land of the Huron Wendat, the Petun, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. It, this territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Ojibwe people and allied nations to peacefully uh, share and care for the lands and resources around the Great Lakes, where, where I am right now, and I think some of you are also in this region. And, and if you are not in this region, I, walk, I encourage you to think of the region where you are and the original people that um, inhabited this land, those lands. To all that was here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island, we honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors beneath our feet and we acknowledge the land. Our ears to the ground, we can hear them. The Cree, the Métis, the Dene, the Soto, and Anich and Anishinaabe, the Dakota Nation and Lakota Nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Inu, and all nations that came before us and those yet to come. An affinity of footsteps of those who, who long called this land home, the, the, the unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization and the opening of this land to allow treaty to welcome, uh, to allow treaty to come alive, we affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respect to the indigenous nations and ancestors of the land. Once again, I want to acknowledge the land of the Huron Wendat, Petun, Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the, first, uh, of the Credit First Nation. This is a territory covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee the, and the Ojibwe and allied nations to share and care for the land and resources around the Great Lakes, where I am and some of you are right now. I also want to take this opportunity to uh, acknowledge also and pay respect and tribute to the 200 and plus children whose uh, mass grave was just recently in, revealed in BC. It's not easy to share and to acknowledge that history, but I think it is our responsibility to do so. And so not just to pay respect and acknowledgement to the land, but also to the people and in particular those who went through that very painful experience of the Indian residential schools. So today um, we have four speakers. That's not necessarily the order in which they will appear. But the presentations today will cover the rights and, and responsibilities of workers and, employ, and employers uh, during, uh, the, in the context of COVID-19. So if, in that case, I will turn it over to our first guest speaker, um, Eduardo Huesca. And just a little bit about Eduardo here. Um, Eduardo is an outreach worker and, work and program coordinator with the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers, OCAO. Uh, Eduardo has worked directly with migrant agricultural worker communities across Ontario for over 15 years now. And he has presented occupational health and safety workshops to migrant workers on farms and in the community as well. Earlier today, he also told us that they also work and collaborate with uh, employers and so, that is good to know in case uh, any of you may want to reach out to um, Eduardo and Ocao. Uh, so Eduardo, I'll turn it over to you and, and then I'll introduce each speaker as they come. All right, Eduardo, floor okay. is yours. Sounds good. And, and I think with Mavra, maybe would you mind introducing her as well? Because I think we kind of, we, I might pass it over to her a bit quickly. So just in case, maybe that Thank you. Be... No, I, I don't mind introducing her at all. So first of all, Myra, thank you also to you as well so much for um, agreeing to speak today. Uh, Myra Kamar, I apologize if I if I mispronounced your name. Uh, 
Mavra is an epidemiologist with seven years of academic and practical experience in public health. Uh, recently, Mavra was involved in a project in collaboration with OCAL and Ontario, uh, you're gonna have to help me with that, OFVGA. Um, Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association. Yeah. Involving the identific identification, compilation, creation, and dissemination of uh, COVID-19 resources, targeting the needs of international agricultural workers. Uh, currently, Mavra is working with OCAL on the um, Carol's uh, work, and employ uh, work and Empowerment Project as a public health content coordinator. So with that, I'll turn it over to Eduardo and Mavra. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thanks for having us. And so I'm Eduardo Huesca, as was mentioned. Um, I work for the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. Uh, so we just wanted to share some information um, with you. And sorry, this box, I don't know if this was happening earlier, but I think we're gonna just try to, hopefully it disappears when I present. Um, but we wanted to share with you some information around health and safety responsibilities and rights um, for employers, supervisors, and workers, just to be able to, kind of feed our discussion that we're, you know, excited to have with you all about, um, you know, working together and, and recognizing kind of everybody's roles and, and uh, rights uh, during COVID. Um, we're focusing on occupational health and safety rights because we're an occupational health and safety organization. But um, in the discussion, I'm sure other folks may be able to contribute uh, knowledge around, you know, human rights and some of the other rights that, that workers um, also uh, have and, and can claim. Um, and also, Two, we want to recognize that when we're talking about rights, it's a bit com complicated, as we all know. Um, you know, sometimes rights on paper don't necessarily mean that things work out, um, you know, in real life as straightforward at all. And, and especially with, uh, you know, international agricultural workers um, in some situations, there's a lot of challenges that people continue to experience. So, again, we'll be, you know, presenting, um, you know, laying things out, but I think we'll get more into that into, into the discussion as well. Um, so I just wanted to quickly uh, just, uh, you know, really fast uh, talk a bit about Oak House. So we're a network of occupational health clinics uh, distributed across the province of Ontario. Um, we were founded in 1989 and our teams, each clinic has a team of medical and scientific experts. And a, really our goal is to protect workers and their communities from occupational disease, injuries and illnesses and support workers um, in promoting their social, mental and physical well-being. Um, and we also, like was mentioned, work with employers, so our, our resources are free, and we, we work with employers as well to, to support their health and safety programs um, uh, as well. Um, since 2006, we've been working with migrant agriculture workers, as was mentioned, so here are just some, some quick pictures of us on the ground um, in different communities, uh, uh, running both um, medical occupational health uh, clinics, as well as workshops on the farm and in the community to share um, occupational health and safety information with workers as well. Um, so this is a bit of an outline that we wanted to, you know, go through. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Occupational Health and Safety Act, just to give a bit of the premise. Um, that's the legal framework under which we actually um, identify uh, the rights and responsibilities, the health and safety, occupational health and safety rights and responsibilities. I'm just going to touch a little bit on the Ontario Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development. That's the government ministry that, um, that oversees the, and, and enforces the OHSA, the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, and then I'm going to jump into um, health and safety at the workplace, um, employer, supervisor and worker responsibilities, um, health and safety representatives and joint health and safety committees, um, as they really play uh, an important role in the workplace and, and themselves have, uh, you know, important activities and responsibilities and, and rights as well. Then I'm going to focus in on worker rights um, and then working together, you know, addressing health and safety concerns at the workplace as well as a little bit of information around, you know, what is in place or, or what can we think about when, uh, you know, concerns are not addressed at the workplace. Um, and then, you know, touching on worker anti-reprisal protections that, that um, are important as well. And then I'm gonna pass it over to, to Mavra, who's going to look at specifically the employer requirement to have a COVID-19 safety plan. And that's kind of, she's gonna share some you know, an overview of what that is, but some key considerations around what what um, currently is in place and employers are are um, are uh, re um, uh, required to put in place at the workplace around COVID uh, nineteen safety. Okay, so um, to get started, uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, as I mentioned, is the legal framework um, 
that looks at the regulating um, of, of workplace health and safety in Ontario. And I know that there's under the Kairos network, there's some folks that are from other provinces as well. Um, but this would be, a, you know, a very similar across provinces. Uh, we're based in Toronto, uh, sorry, on, in Ontario. So uh, we focus um, on that. But uh, the Act sets out the responsibilities, uh, the rights of all parties in the workplace. Um, so it sets out the responsibilities of employers, supervisors and workers and, and the rights as well. It also sets up the procedures for dealing with workplace hazards and for the uh, enforcement of regulations. Um, and it also um, important to kind of recognize around the Occupational Health and Safety Act, um, because it's a provincial legal act, um, it, it, it's, um, it applies to workers regardless of immigration status. So that's something that we often um, talk to people about and, and often sometimes people um, aren't aware. Um, and so again, the rights uh, that, that the act uh, provides workers, um, it would provide to workers regardless of their immigration status. Um, and the OHSA provides minimum standards. So by this, it's also around, you know, depending on the work contract or if the workplace is, is uh, unionized, there can be additional, um, you know, uh, details provided through those agreements um, that go beyond the act, but uh, the, the act provides the foundations. So the Ontario Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development, again, in different provinces, it would be a, a different uh, Ministry of Labour, but um, it's the, the provincial government uh, ministry that's responsible for um, enforcing the Occupational Health and Safety Act and for the focus on preventing occupational health injury and illness at workplaces. It sets, communicates and enforces occupational health and safety requirements under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, it inspects workplaces and investigates complaints. It investigates work refusals um, or critical injuries. Um, and, uh, and it ensures that regulations are followed and, um, and looks at kind of what happens in, in those situations to, to then um, uh, determine uh, potentially further prevention uh, requirements and things like that beyond uh, those situations. Um, again, the Ministry of Labor, as we're gonna kind of touch on is a resource if concerns are not addressed at the workplace level. Um, and they provide support uh, regardless of immigration status. So again, the Ministry of Labor being provincial does not enforce immigration legislation. Um, so uh, again, their, their um, activities, their, their, um, uh, all, all of their work uh, is supportive of, of workers regardless of their immigration status. So I just really wanted to quickly touch on what is referred to as the internal responsibility system. So this is a, a key concept or framework referenced in occupational health and safety. Um, under the internal responsibility system, the idea is that everybody at the workplace, employers, supervisors, and workers has an important role to play in health and safety. And that the idea is that by working together, that's how um, health and safety is achieved. Um, so again, everybody's you know, doing their part and working together in collaboration um, will provide a health and safe uh, workplace. Um, the IRS often is criti criticized um, you know, by, by some because it, it really paints kind of an ideal picture of working together um, and, and resolving health and safety concerns. Um, however, you know, it, uh, it lends to recognition that if in a workplace, there isn't that collaborative, you know, relationship between, um, between workplace parties, um, obviously there requires then to be something there in place, right? So um, again, it's a, it's a concept widely used, but something that even in discussion, we can, we can unpack a bit more. Uh, but again, it, it is definitely a driver of talking about collaboration and working together at the workplace. Um, so recognizing the working together, I did want to ask a quick question. I know we're a small group of people, but I tend to ask this question when I run this workshop for uh, workers themselves. But, you know, recognizing that it's important to work together, um, who do you think does have the most responsibility at the workplace for health and safety? So I can't see the chat, but I know Mavra was going to um, look at it, but feel free uh, if people want to throw into the chat, you know, who they think at the workplace has the most responsibility for health and safety? The one who has the most responsibility for everything. So the management. Okay, yes. I have so one management. that's everyone. Okay. Should, oh, another question, should have or does have? I would say should have. <laughs> Who's, who, who would have a requirement to have the most responsibility at the workplace around health and safety? Isabel said us. Okay. All right. Well, 
So yeah, I, I put this in because it's very interesting. When, when I've presented this to international or, or migrant agricultural workers, they end up answering workers. Um, and they often say it's themselves. It's, it's this idea that they're the responsible people to protect themselves um, from health and safety um, hazards and, and keeping safe at work. Um, again, even though the Occupational Health and Safety Act, you know, talks about everybody having a responsibility, it's clear that employers actually have the most responsibility under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And the, the reason for this is obviously they're the ones that control the work environment, uh, the equipment, the work tasks, the pace, um, and therefore, you know, they have the most responsibility for ensuring health and safety at the workplace. Um, and so I... I point to that because again, um, I would say the majority of workers when I present this um, answered workers. So it definitely lends to having it be a bit uh, you know, of, a, of a shift, right? Away from people feeling like they might be alone in, in looking at uh, their health and safety to understanding that there's, there's requirements um, and expectations um, uh, there as well, right? Which I know are complicated, but, but it definitely seems like um, something that we need to unpack with, with more workers. Um, so starting off with that, I was just going to spend a bit of time looking over uh, or going over the employer's occupational health and safety responsibilities at the workplace. Um, so starting off, you know, the employers um, are responsible for informing workers about any hazards and dangers that could be related to the work that they're doing. Um, so this could be substances that, that workers could uh, be working around or with. Um, maybe it's equipment, maybe it's just the practices, uh, the work practices that they're doing. It's up to the employer to inform workers about any hazards related to the work they're doing. And here we, we put, you know, SARS-CoV-2. So at present day during the pandemic, it's up to the employer to inform workers about the risks of, of, of um, this virus and of, of COVID-19. Um, similarly, it's, it's the employer's responsibility to show workers how to work safely. Um, so, you know, provide training, health and safety training. Um, and, you know, this is a requirement workers, you know, without knowing, uh, you know, they might be new to the job or they might be new to the task. So again, it's the, it's the employer's responsibility to show uh, and explain. Um, it's also the employer's responsibility to create, explain and enforce health and safety rules and policies for all aspects of the workplace. So this, you know, this would kind of result in, pro, you know, creating a health and safety program for that, health, uh, for that workplace. And Mavra is going to talk a little bit more about that in the context of COVID, which is the COVID-19 um, health and safety plan um, that, it, that is now a requirement. Um, and I'm not going to touch too much on this because she's, uh, Mavra is going to mention this, but within that setting of, of the rules and policies and, and that safety program, um, employers are, um, you know, should be um, following that, uh, applying the hierarchy of controls, what's referred to as the hierarchy of controls, which you can kind of see as this little triangle. Um, and it's, a um, you know, uh, well, discussed in occupational health and safety. And, and what really it focuses on is to ensure that an employer, when they're putting in their controls and their health and safety programming, they're focusing and prioritizing um, the controls that are the most effective in protecting uh, workers from the hazards. So, you know, at the top you have elimination. So trying to eliminate the hazard altogether or substituting, you know, the hazard or changing it or removing it um, for something that is, is, is less harmful. Um, to then going downwards to less, uh, less effective um, interventions. So engineering controls um, could be, you know, uh, designing work environments to reduce exposure to the hazard, um, things like ventilation or opening up a space or maybe putting some barriers um, to the bottom where it, where it's just PPE and equipment. Um, so again, they should really be focusing on the most effective uh, uh, interventions and, and controls. So um, the employer should be also making sure that the workers use and wear any protective equipment that is required. Um, they all should be looking at focused or th they are also responsible, sorry, for ensuring that the supervisor is competent. So that's kind of and we're going to get a little bit about uh, into about supervisors. But oftentimes a supervisor is actually the person who might be working the most closely with workers. Right. But it still is the employer's responsibility to make sure that the, the supervisor is competent, to make sure that um, that they know the work, they know the health and safety laws and how they apply to the work. And number six is, is a very important responsibility under the general duty clause of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, that an employer should do everything reasonable to keep workers from getting hurt or sick on the job. And this is a, a very important responsibility because it really captures a bit of what is the goal of, of 
kind of their the employer's role in, in all of this is just to race basically be looking out uh, for doing everything um, reasonably possible right uh, to ensure people are, are not getting sick or injured on, on the job. Um, there's also some uh, requirements for employers to post some safety posters so um, the prevention, the safe, uh, the health and safety at work prevention poster should be up in, in the workers' languages, as well as um, a poster uh, identifying what to do if a worker is hurt on the job or uh, hurt or, or becomes ill at the job. So that's the, um, the WSIB poster here um, um, at the side. And there should also be a copy of the Health and Safety Act um, in, in the workplace uh, so that workers could also have access to that, to that book, which is the little green book here as well. Um, this is an important uh, requirement as well. So since 2014, employers in Ontario um, are um, required to provide uh, basic occupational health and safety awareness training to workers, but also um, ensure that supervisors take their, uh, their training um, that, that aligns to this content. Um, and this training provides workers and supervisors with the basics in terms of health and safety um, awareness training. So this is really important because if, you know, uh, every worker in Ontario, some of us have taken this, every worker in Ontario should have taken this. Um, and for international agricultural workers, this would, you know, provide them a good foundation to understand the responsibilities, their rights, their health and safety rights, as well as what to expect from their employers and supervisors. So in our experience, it's it's a, been a bit of a mixed bag. We, we've ended up connecting to workers who have not received this uh, this training. We've also helped farms provide this uh um, this information to workers, but uh, it definitely doesn't seem to have been reaching everybody. Um, employers also have a responsibility to ensure there's a health and safety rep or a joint health and safety committee at the workplace, depending on their type of, of workplace, um, both in terms of the commodity, as well as the number of workers that are employed full time. And I'm in the next slide, I'm going to touch a little bit more about that. But Health and safety reps and joint health and safety committees are very important. They have um, a lot of important duties and act, you know activities uh, that uh, really support health and safety at the workplace. So under the employer responsibility, you also have a responsibility um, to support the mandated activities of, of the rep or, or joint health and safety committee, which includes, for example, doing a monthly workplace inspection, um, you know, identifying any concerns from workers and making recommendations to the employer, um, which then require response by the employer. Um, they, they help, uh, you know, investigate work refusals or, or critical injuries. So again, the employer, um, you know, is, is uh, responsible for supporting the, those important activities. Um, and here it's just touching a little bit more about um, that in terms of um, you know, the requirement for reps or, or joint health and safety committees, so greenhouses or mushroom, dairy, hog, cattle or poultry um, uh, workplaces require a full committee um, and at least half of the committee have to be made up of workers and both the, the committee members and or the rep have to be actually um, nominated by workers or chosen by the workers, elected by workers, right? Um, so that's kind of an important part too. So workers are electing, you know, somebody or a few people if it's the committee that, you know, they, they feel will do a, a good job and represent the, um, their health and safety, um, you know, priorities. And, and here you also kind of, again, have a bit of information around those important functions of, of both the rep and the committee. So again, it's, it's a, a very important part of, of health and safety in the workplace. And in our, in our ex, um, experience, a lot of workplaces are still challenged and, and don't necessarily have a, a well-functioning um, joint health and safety committee. And I know there, um, you know, Vicky and Morris are, are on this, uh, are on this uh, session too that are going to chat. So I know that there are some, some places that have been doing this for quite some time, but we, we, have, uh, we have identified that in other uh, workplaces, um, this is not necessarily, um, you know, they're, they're challenged to, to put this together. Um, so just quickly, supervisors, um, also have uh, responsibilities under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. The responsibilities very much mirror those of this of their employer. Um, so here it's almost a repetition of what I've just went over with employers. However, um, you know, they're really, again, noting that they're often maybe the ones that are working more directly with workers. Um, they, they're tasked to explain, show workers, train workers. Um, but again, at, in, in the grand scale of things, if something's not working with the supervisor, if the supervisor's not 
um, complying with the responsibilities, it's still the employer who is most responsible because the employer is actually responsible again for the supervisor being competent, right? So that's kind of um, a, a thing to, to realize here. And again, the same number five is that same uh, general duty clause to do everything reasonable to keep workers from getting hurt or sick on the job also you know, falls onto the supervisor. Um, and then uh, just transitioning to workers, um, I'm, you know, like other uh, folks at the workplace, workers also have responsibilities under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, these include that, you know, workers should follow health and safety policies and procedures once those are explained to them and, and they're informed um, to work safely. I'll always wear equipment or any, any health and safety or, or safety equipment that is uh, required by the employer. Um, and, and we tend to hear, you know, sometimes we, we've run sessions with workers in the past where they mention equipment being, you know, a bit uncomfortable or when it gets hot, you know, uh, whether it's uh, different types of pr personal protective equipment can get uncomfortable, but it definitely is a responsibility responsibility of workers to, to wear that equipment when it is required to, to keep themselves and others safe. Um, also, they have the responsibility to report any hazards that they see at the workplace. So the idea here is that workers might be the ones that are really seeing what's going on at the workplace, um, what's going on with the practices. So under the act, they, they're actually responsible to report um, anything that they see, including here in, in um, you know, the COVID part would fall under, under that as well in terms of reporting um, symptoms of illness what could fall under the Occupational Health and Safety Act um, around that. Um, and yes, and just generally not to change any equipment or tamper with any equipment um, that could make it dangerous for themselves or others. Um, and also not to engage with horseplay, pranks, bullying, um, or anything like that too is also a worker responsibility. Um, I'm gonna now talk a little bit about worker rights. And this is kind of a bit of, of a, a crux uh, that we really focus on um, and, and talk to workers about. Um, so under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, workers have three um, central rights, the right to know, uh, the right to participate, and the right to refuse unsafe work. Um, so the right to know, um, so workers have the right to be informed and be made aware of any hazards that they may encounter at the workplace. So this right really goes along with what I mentioned was the responsibility of the employer and supervisor to inform workers about hazards. So the, the idea here is that as a worker, we have the right to know what in our work could potentially make us sick or injure us, right? So that's kind of a right uh, the workers have. Uh, under this right, it's also the right to be trained on how to work safely. So not only understand the hazard, but also understand on how to do the work safely to protect um, ourselves as, as workers. Um, so again, it might be a new worker, it might be a new task, a new new set of equipment, so they have the right to be informed and, and to know how to do that safely. And this right also falls um, to health and safety reps and joint health and safety committees to have the right to engage, um, or sorry, to the right to know um, any reports or any information that the employer has around health and safety. The uh, joint health and safety committee or the rep um, have that right as well to access that information. The workers have also the right to participate. So to ask health and safety questions, and, and we often talk to workers to say, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you, you ask a question, if you don't understand something, or if you think something's not clear in terms of, of how it's going to keep you safe or, or um, how safety is being considered, you know, ask again um, and, and, you know, raise the concern. This is, this is your right. Um, and, you know, that, all, you know, touches on reporting concerns or identifying hazards participating in discussion and really, again, referring back to the internal responsibility system, the idea of that workers have the right to participate and, and be part of finding solutions at the workplace to ensure their health and safety. Um, and that's, you know, uh, discuss, or that's a, a key right under the, the act. Um, and again, this also includes electing. So participation also includes electing and communicating with, with the rep and joint health and safety committee member. So I just wanted to share this really quick case study. This is a real real life case study um, from a farm that we've worked with, um, at Willow Tree Farm. And it, it kind of shows exactly kind of an ideal situation of how workers you know, leverage this right to participate in health and safety. So on this farm, um, a group of workers, they're, they're from Mexico, they identified uh, that they were experiencing back pain from the type of basket that they were using to basically uh, transport sweet potato. Um, so they were using this kind of wooden basket here that, that I've included a picture that often these baskets are very awkward to carry. You have to, you know, they're quite heavy. They're 
to be carried by one person. They don't have really good grip or handles. So a lot of workers were identifying that they were um, experiencing back pain. So the workers raised this concern to the employer and the employer started looking into other carrying bins that could be used instead. And they actually resulted in, in purchasing these bins. So this is a real picture from that farm. The workers asked that they prefer not to be um, identified. So we've covered their faces, but these are the new bins. And not only are these bins cheaper, so the employer actually saved money on these plastic bins, but these bins were a lot easier to carry. Workers could carry them together, as well as even individually, they had better grips and were a bit smaller, so they would make more trips. And the workers basically talked about how a lot of their back pains uh, got, a, back pain got a lot better. So this is kind of a key example of, you know, workers identifying concern and leveraging the right to participate in occupational health and safety to resolve uh, this back strain. Um, but we know that, you know, oftentimes that doesn't uh, sometimes work out like that um, in different workplaces. So the third occupational health and safety right is an important one, um, and, it, and it also is important right now during COVID. Um, so under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, workers have the right to refuse unsafe work. So if a worker feels that the work they're being asked to do is unsafe or it's going to put themselves or somebody else in danger, they have the right to stop and refuse to do that work until their uh, concerns are addressed. So there's a bit of a, a process that goes to, along with the right to refuse unsafe work. So the worker has to stop what they're doing, let a supervisor or employer know. And then that supervisor or employer has to investigate along with the health and safety rep or joint health and safety committee to try to address the worker concern. And so that might look um, at uh, figuring out uh, what can be done to, to address that concern. It could be new training. Maybe the worker just needs to be trained or explained how to do that work safely, or maybe the job itself has to be changed altogether to ensure that it's not uh, creating a hazard for workers. Um, if, if the concern is resolved, that worker can, can then you know, go back to work and everything proceeds well, um, you know, but if it doesn't, if the concern's not addressed, um, then, the, the worker has the right to continue to refuse that unsafe work. And that's when, um, you know, outside uh, the worker can appeal to outside parties, including the Ministry of Labor, Training and, Skill and, and Skills Development. Um, but this, this is an important right to really be a bit of a, a stop and, and consider um, when, when people could find themselves uh, feeling like the work they're being asked to do is, is gonna uh, jeopardize their, their health and safety. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm, I know I'm, I'm kind of, uh, this is a bit of a long lot of information, so almost done, but um, this is also a key part of responsibilities at the workplace. So in Ontario, every workplace needs to have a violence and harassment in the workplace policy or anti-violence and harassment policy. Um, and this policy needs to include, you know, forms or, or identify how workers uh, are to be educated on anti-harassment and anti-violence. Um, you know, how these practices are going to be prevented and what to do and clear procedures um, in case these cases do arise. Um, and so, you know, here there's some information around what to do if, if, you, if you encounter violence and harassment, but generally speaking as a responsibility, workplaces need to have this policy in place. Um, so just to kind of wind down a bit, um, generally speaking then in terms of health and safety, um, if, you know, if a worker has concern, you in terms of the internal responsibility system and, and working together, the idea of working together with, with workplace parties, the idea is to, you know, talk to coworkers, um, you know, speak to employers and supervisors when you have a concern and speak and really leverage the role of a health and safety rep and joint health and safety committees. And the rep in the committees are really important for, for the context of a lot of workers who might not feel comfortable speaking directly to supervisors, and employers, reps and committees can really help with that. Um, however, in the case that concerns are not resolved in the workplace, um, you know, then it's important for workers to seek outside support and, and address a situation where they might feel that they're, you know, they're in, in risk or, or facing a hazard and, and not safe and, and healthy at the workplace. So this can include, um, you know, community advocates, uh, there's legal clinic support, uh, some, some workers connect to their count, uh, country consulates, um, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the Ministry of Labor is also identified as, as a, a key um, uh, uh, resource in case uh, concerns are not addressed. So this slide speaks to that, uh, contacting the Ministry of Labor's Occupational Health and Safety Contact Center um, and explains a bit of how uh, workers would do so. Um, again, the line is a bit complicated and we know that um, a lot of times when workers do 
end up uh, contacting the Ministry of Labor. It, it might be through some advocates, through some supports of community groups. Um, but that is, uh, you know, this is some information around how to get to that. And they do have translation support uh, as well. Um, and then the last bit of this is the, the right of workers against reprisals. So a reprisal is, you know, um, a punishment or, or you know, it, it's, it's basically a situation where an employer either reprimands, punishes, uh, threatens to punish or dismisses a worker for basically um, abiding by their health and safety rights or exercising their rights or raising concerns. Um, and so again, this is illegal um, and, and, um, and workers have the right uh, against reprisals. And so the Ministry of Labor does identify themselves, you know, if a worker is facing reprisals um, to connect with them as well um, uh, to seek support. The actual process of reprisals is a bit more complicated. Um, it's not the Ministry of Labor who actually um, investigates the actual occurrence of a reprisal. Um, a worker would actually have to file a complaint with the Ontario Labor Relations Board. So here's a bit of information and I can share, we'll, we'll share this information um, after the presentation too, um, but uh, around how to do so, there's some resources, including um, the Office of the Worker Advisor, as well as the Worker Health and Safety Legal Clinic, um, and the Law Society of, of, of Ontario can also provide support for, for non-unionized workers who might need uh, guidance around put it, put, um, a filing a, a reprisal uh, complaint. And then this is the last slide for me, and sorry, I think I'm um, a bit over, but uh, so unfortunately, we, you know, this is really important. Um, and as Mavra is gonna talk to a bit more is everything I've kind of mentioned and, and the whole idea of working together and, uh, you know, having workers really talk about and raising concerns and, and, and uh, raising flags around anything they feel is, is unsafe at the work. It really hinges on workers feeling confident that they're not going to face reprisals for doing so, that these rights are actually secured. But unfortunately, you know, um, uh, we do hear about cases of reprisals and workers continue to be uh, concerned about uh, their work being threatened if they do raise concerns. Um, and this is one case that was a more recent case of, of a worker um, you know, winning an anti-reprisal case against an employer uh, when, when the employer tried to fire them for raising COVID-19 safety concerns at their workplace. And what's, inter what's important really quickly to, to acknowledge is that even the title, this talks about this being a rare reprisal case because it's recognized that the average worker, um, if they're unsup, you know, it, it would be very difficult for the average worker to connect and, and see through an anti-reprisal case. And so unfortunately, um, I think that's where the fear and, and the hesitation from a lot of workers does come from speaking out because of, of, um, of uh, a lack of exactly how they would uh, be able to protect themselves against a reprisal. So that's that's all for me, and I'm going to pass it over to Mavra, who's going to um, dive a bit deeper into uh, an employer requirement, which is the COVID-19 safety plan. Thank you. Uh, so Eduardo covered a lot of information, uh, and I'll be applying this to COVID-19. Next slide, please. So what is a COVID-19 safety plan? Um, so assessing your unique workplace is pivotal in ensuring you choose the correct control measures to minimize the risk of COVID-19 entering the workplace and potentially triggering an outbreak. A COVID-19 safety plan is a type of checklist that follows federal, provincial, and municipal public health guidelines and outlines key COVID-19 considerations and control measures that should be implemented. It often includes COVID-19 resources embedded within, in, within it, including training materials, public health unit contacts, COVID-19 testing locations, and primary and emergency healthcare services. Every farm and the workers employed at each farm are different and have different needs. And so it's important that a COVID-19 safety plan caters to the needs of the specific farm and the workers on the farm. Due to the ever-changing nature of this pandemic and the public health guidelines uh, forever changing, um, routinely review and update the safety plan. That's a very important piece of all of this. The MLTSD has created an outline of a COVID-19 safety plan and what it should include. So the following slides will be following that outline. As mentioned, in order to prevent a COVID-19 outbreak in your workplace, your COVID-19 safety plan should be customized to your workplace and workers. It's important to assess the characteristics of your work site, region, workers, and tasks that can impact the risk and control of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Ensuring collaboration of all workplace parties in health and safety is key and is part of the internal responsibility system, which is the main framework of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, as Eduardo had mentioned. 
Supervisors, health and safety reps, and GHC play an important role in the health and safety of a workplace, and ensuring they understand their responsibility under the Act and have relevant training is a key step in keeping this farm safe from COVID-19. Another important consideration, although not mandatory, is ensuring these entities are representative of the workers. So for example, having supervisors who can speak Spanish in a farm that has predominantly Spanish-speaking workers. What this will do is it will open the communication channels and will support workers in exercising their right to participate. Next slide, please. Controlling exposures to occupational hazards is a fundamental method of protecting workers. So traditionally, uh, I provide this uh, hierarchy of control graphic, and it's been used to determine how to implement feasible and effective control solutions. So the idea here is at the top, those controls are potentially more effective and protective than those at the bottom. So following the hierarchy of uh, control normally leads to the implementation of an inherently safer system where the risk of illness such as COVID-19 and injury has been substantially reduced. So an example of an engineering control would be redesigning work areas to limit crowding and allowing for physical distancing. And an example of an administrative control would be COVID-19 related policies, procedures, education, scheduling and signage. So as Eduardo mentioned, workers have the right to know. A key part of the safety plan is to orient your workers. Some international ag agriculture workers have voiced reluctancy to ask questions or identify concerns related to health and safety. It's important to create a supportive health and safety culture that builds workers' confidence and promotes participation. Reviewing all COVID-19 related topics, policies, and procedures in the language most suitable for workers and in a format that ensures comprehension is mandatory for a successful safety plan. So I will be going over key COVID-19 issues that have been outlined by MLTSD. Uh, and I'll be going not too much in depth, just lightly talking about each one. And what I say is by no means all encompassing. And I would recommend for employers to refer to the MLTSD version of their COVID-19 safety plan. So isolation and quarantine. So examples of this within the uh, safety plan would be having policies and procedures in place for newly, oh, sorry, go back. Thank you. Um, having policies and procedures in place for newly arriving workers and for those who potentially test positive during the season, making sure you have procedures to safely transport workers to and from quarantine and isolation uh, sites, and communicating to workers how they can access food and essentials. As employers, uh, you are expected to ensure food is fresh, good quality, and meets the workers' needs in terms of variety and quantity during workers' quarantine and isolation period. And finally, also having COVID-19 COVID specific return to work policy is very important. In terms of income support and WSIB, discussing compensation is very important. When workers initially arrive, they are paid for the two weeks in quarantine, and if they contract COVID-19 at the workplace, they are covered under WSIB. Having knowledge about WSIB coverage may support workers' confidence in reporting symptoms or illness, recognizing that they will be provided income support when, uh, while they recover. And this is important because they'll make sure that COVID-19 doesn't further spread across the farm. In terms of emergency health care, in general and especially during quarantine periods, workers must have means to contact the employer and have information on how to access emergency health care. This is exceptionally important, especially in light of the recent deaths of international agriculture workers while in quarantine and isolation. Providing clarity on how workers can access help and support can help save lives. In general, having COVID-19 education and screening tools in place, having policies and procedures in place, so things like what types of screening is going to happen on the farm, what signage is going to be posted, um, are workers going to be self-monitoring, etc. In terms of testing, understanding where workers can get tested, training workers on what the testing procedure is like and what the results mean. So what does a positive result mean? What does a negative result mean? In terms of outbreak management, um, this should include how to prevent and limit the further spread of the virus by sending positive cases to isolate, informing any workers who may have been exposed, reporting positive cases to the local public health unit and MLTSC, what to expect from their investigations, how to cooperate with them, and how to respond once the outbreak is contained. So with this, once the outbreak is contained, it's very important to go back to your COVID-19 safety plan and reassess it. Where did something go wrong? How can we prevent this from happening again? Next slide, please. Having physical distancing and cohorting procedures in place, making sure workers understand what cohort safety is and how to maintain it. 
Um, also recognizing that the risk of COVID-19 transmission is higher in more enclosed and crowded spaces. So you should ensure that air handling or HVAC systems are maintained according to manufacturer's instructions. Additional steps could be using portable air cleaners, keeping windows and doors open when possible, um, adjusting your HVAC system to increase the amount of fresh air and reduce recirculation, um, continue ventilation even after business hours, and using available outdoor spaces whenever possible. So for example, for meetings, at break times and meal times. In terms of hygiene safety practices, ensuring you have hand washing facilities in place, workers have access to hand sanitizing, um, having mask, respiratory and glove safety, procedures and policies, understanding when you should use a mask, when you should use a respirator, et cetera. In terms of shared housing, um, while this is, a, a pub, this is public health jurisdiction, it's important to consider how else to limit the spread of the virus. So for example, manipulating sleeping arrangements to allow for physical distancing uh, and providing ventilation and air cleaning in the housing areas. In terms of shared transportation, this is uh, an important one because uh, it, it is a, can increase the risk of COVID-19. So having workers, uh, having policies and procedures on, on workers only traveling with their cohorts, uh, screening workers before traveling, for example, and making sure vehicles are well ventilated. So these, what I've just gone over are more requirements in terms of COVID-19 issues that should be included in your safety plan. Um, and once again, as I mentioned, I didn't include every single detail about each topic, just in terms of timing. Um, and then, sorry, next slide, please. And then as a public health professional and as an epidemiologist, I would implore employers to consider including these topics in their COVID-19 safety plan. Um, so vaccination is a key public health control measure to declare this pandemic over. And as a public health expert, I would recommend employers consider their role in terms of vaccination. So it's critical to let workers know they cannot be forced to vaccinate against COVID-19 and will not face reprisal. Providing information to workers about uh, the COVID-19 vaccine will help them make an informed decision will support vaccine confidence and will minimize the risk of COVID-19 in the workplace. In terms of primary and mental health care, physical, mental, and emotional well-being is critical for the overall well-being of individuals. Providing workers resources to access primary and mental health care, um, and especially those services in the workers' preferred language, can contribute to the overall health and safety of workers. Next slide, please. So applying this to your workplace, will help minimize the risk of COVID-19. It acts like a guide to confirm you've covered your bases, you haven't left any you know, stone unturned. And what's very important for you, to, for you to effectively use this plan is to communicate with international agriculture workers based on their literacy, language, cultural, and knowledge needs. Next slide, please. And finally, for this to work, there has to be a commitment to anti-reprisal, fostering confidence in workers, and communicating with workers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mavra and Eduardo. I know that there's a lot of good information that you share with us and uh, maybe later on, if you have any questions, anybody else, um, we can include those in the question and answers period. Um, just so we can move along because it's getting closer to, um, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Mr. Morris Gerberg. Uh, how do you pronounce your name, Morris? I don't want to do that myself. Uh, Gervais. Gervais, thank you. Uh, so Morris is a second generation uh, farmer who owns and operates Berry Hill Farms just outside of Berry, Ontario. Um, Morris grew up on Berry Hill Farms. It was a tobacco farm which was established by his parents, Adrian and Evelyn in, in 1968. But in the late 70s, the farm exited the tobacco industry by beginning to grow, uh, pick your own strawberries. Throughout the 80s, Berry Hill Farm expanded its offerings to include farm fresh asparagus, as well as uh, pick your own raspberries and blueberries. Uh, Morris graduated from the University of Wealth, uh, Wealth sorry, with a degree in agriculture in, 18, in 1889 and accepted full-time employment with Molson Breweries while continuing to work on the farm during the spring and summer. But following almost four years of employment with Molson, he realized big corporate life was not for him and began farming full-time uh, um, alongside his parents in 1993. The farm now produces over 200 acres of fruits and vegetables, everything from asparagus to apples. 
and the majority of which is all is sold either uh, by pick your your own or at his uh, own farm and market. Uh, Morris refereed junior hockey for 10 years and since retiring, he continues to play beer league. I don't know what that is. I'm going to have to ask you that in the question and answer period. Uh, beer league uh, hockey twice per week. He's also an avid hunter and, an, and is particularly passionate about deer hunting. Morris and his wife, Kendra, uh, homeschooled their four children, Avery 20, me 18, Audrey 13, and Isaac 12. Um, also, uh, Morris is, is part of a, a known neighbor. It's a group uh, of people in the region that come together to work together, I guess, in support of migrant workers. Uh, also a member of the Berry Growers of Ontario, uh, Ontario Asparagus Growers Marketing Board, uh, the Ontario High Bush Brew, Blueberry Growers Association, and the Simcoe County Farm Fresh Marketing Association. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Maurice uh, Gerbe. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for that. Um, sorry, I gave you all that information. I should have briefed it up a little bit so you didn't have to hear all my whole life story. But anyways, thank you. For oh, that. it's good to it's good to hear. <laughs> it's good to hear it. I I, I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm uh, sure people do. So, so I mean, I don't know, really. Um, I guess what you want to hear from me is how we've handled COVID-19 here on the farm. Is that what, um, is that mostly what you want me to explain? I'm, I'm struggling to kind of reference my, frame my comments. No, it's, 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 it's what, 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 you know whatever information you want to share with the with the audience right and with with uh the topic is is responsive response rights and responsibilities during COVID 19. um so how, this is this the floor is yours i uh, okay all right well you what i, I want I, you to say i guess maybe what i'll do is is i'll just uh go through how the COVID 19 experience has been with us here on the farm and how we have fortunately been able to keep everyone everyone safe um, but i guess i'll i'll right at the start here i will ask one question maybe we can save it for the question answer period later but you know through all of the previous two presentations it's framed as rights and responsibilities it's clear to me that workers have rights and that employers have responsibilities but the question i have would be do employers have any rights in ontario and i guess i'll frame it i'll frame it just kind of quickly with a, some with a, something that happened to us early on in the pandemic not with the migrant workers but with uh we hire also plenty of uh canadian citizens who live in the area and work with us on the farm and, and early on, we had a uh, parent of one of the young uh, young people, a student, that we hired for the summer, and they were quite concerned. They said, "What are you going to do to keep uh, to keep our son or daughter, whoever it was, safe?" And my uh, manager, who was actually quick thinking on his feet, he said, "Well, he he told her what we're going to do, what we have in place, the plan we have in place." to keep their son or daughter safe but they said what are what are you the employee going to do to keep the rest of us here at the farm safe and so throughout this it's been employers i think have been treading very gingerly on these topics because for example could an employer say this student has not been uh, following quarantine guidelines, public health guidelines, when they're away from the farm. Okay, so then as an employer, must I welcome that person back to work? I kind of operate from, from the framework that employers have very few rights and, and, and workers have all the rights and I have all the responsibilities. So if, if someone can, so that's how we operate and I try to keep people as safe as I can and be a responsible person but i it's 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 a question I, I don't know the answer to so maybe at the end we can find it would an employer in that situation have the right to 
refuse a worker who is not following public health guidelines? I don't know the answer to that. We try to get away. We try to handle it in, uh, you know, as professional a manner as we can. But uh, that's something I'd like to hopefully can learn from this uh, discussion today. So in terms of the, uh, I would say in, in framing how we've been able to handle COVID-19 with our workers from Mexico, <clears throat> this year has been easier than last year, than, than 2020, and it has been safer because of all of the developments that have happened. When I think back to how we quarantined our workers in 2020, <clears throat> uh, we gave them extra space. So our bunk houses went from, you know, it depended on the facility, but some, some facility that would have housed 12 workers instantly was cut in half because the bedrooms had bunk beds and we couldn't accommodate and give them space. So all uh, uh, accommodations uh, were more spacious. But really, we didn't understand the virus early on like we do now. We didn't understand the risks. And well, both the workers did not, and I and we did not as employers. I mean, all of us, we were learning from it. So I think uh, that was what we did. We, as required, we provided sanitation devices, lots of soap and hand washing and bleach, and we uh you know told them to keep their social distance but did they do it in the bunkhouse when they were eating we know they had space for when they were sleeping but did they do it when they were in their homes living <clears throat> don't know so we were probably just fortunate to escape uh in 2020 without an outbreak uh, this year we were planning in 2021 we were planning we had changed a little bit and we had decided that we were going to um, have a, a one dedicated bunkhouse uh, as a quarantine facility in case someone should test positive. But early on, that became clear that that wasn't going to be a good plan. And when the first group of workers arrived and they had with them uh, test kits, Switch Health COVID-19 test kits, we realized that wow, number one this is great. We're going to have the tools to know if workers are, are positive or not, because we didn't have that in 2020 at all. But I realized that if, um, if one worker were to test positive and they were all living in the same facility, despite the fact they had um, uh, adequate sleeping arrangements, that whole facility could potentially be infected and or have to reset and do a, another 10 day quarantine. So we were fortunate. And, and of course, with that group, I said, listen, now guys, and, and of course they had a better understanding coming from Mexico. They were a year into it too. They had a better understanding. We had a better understanding. I'm able to very well communicate with them because I've become fluent in, in Spanish over the years. Um, so, uh, I said, listen, guys, you got to wear your mask all the time. And of course, we're providing masks and we're providing all the cleaning and the and sanitization. And so you got to do this, guys. You got to do this. You have to. And so I was I really stressed the importance of that on them. So for the first seven workers that arrived, uh, they did a good job. We were fortunate. No one was positive. Everyone tested negative. And we were off to a, a good start. But then it became clear that what other farms across Ontario were doing to further mitigate the risk of an infected worker arriving was farmers began quarantining workers in hotels, in private rooms, private facilities, so that if one worker were to test positive during the quarantine period, uh, not all others would be infected and healthy could 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 come out of quarantine after 14 days and begin work so it's because it's a balance you have to and, and i figured this was going to be more expensive as an employer but i didn't want to face the risk of being delayed in my planting 
right? Because if I can't get my crops planted, it's going to cost me a lot more than a little bit of additional hotel quarantine uh, time. So we started with that. And the first group, uh, it was successful. We organized the, uh, the hotel provided breakfast that was included in the uh, breakfast, uh, uh, was included in the, in the rental of the room. The lunches were, uh, we preloaded the rooms with uh, food for them. Uh, each room had a microwave and a, uh, and, a, uh, and a fridge. So they had some food storage for lunch food and snack foods and we preloaded that. And then for dinners, we had a local um, authentic Mexican restaurant who was happy for the work delivered to their, to their bedroom door a um a uh an authentic mexican meal every day so that's how we handle that for the 14 days of quarantine uh and yeah it worked well it was no fun for those guys i felt you know terrible like to be in a in a uh room for 14 days but they as they always do they made the best of it they joked and laughed about it and i learned uh their term for uh, for the Holiday Inn with a 20 inch, 27 inch flat screen TV and uh, full internet access, they call it the Jaula de Oro, the uh, golden cage, the gilded cage. And so when I would go to take the guys, when they were finally out, I'd say, okay, the birds are coming out of the gilded cage. Los pajaritos van a salir de las jaulas, jaulas de oros. And so they were all happy when that was, uh, when that was over and done with. So that's how we got through that. The third set of guys that I quarantined, um, by this time, the government had offered us uh, access to rapid test kits. And uh, other farmers had been saying, you know, they were integrating rapid testing into their COVID plan in order to further, uh, you know, uh, and further attempts to stem uh, stem outbreaks. And so for the third group that was exiting from quarantine, uh, they had received their day 10 switch health test that was negative. But I said, you know what, as an extra level of security, we're going to administer a rapid test to the workers. And five out of six workers were negative but one worker tested positive on day 14 of quarantine, despite the fact of having had a negative test on day 10. So we were very fortunate in that because that whole plan and procedure prevented us. I, if I had relied on the switch health test, uh, I would have brought a worker back thinking he was COVID negative. He would have been living in congregate housing and we would have had an outbreak here on the farm. So we were very fortunate that we did that. So that's become now part of our plan and procedure. After that worker tested positive, the guidelines that the Ontario Ministry had given us was that the um, if you get a positive on the rapid test, don't count on that. Take them to the local health unit to get a proper test, and and sure enough, that verified that verified that uh, the worker was positive. So he had no symptoms, no symptoms throughout. And so he had to do an extra 10 days uh, in the hotel room in the Jaula de Oro. Uh, and it was tough, right? We communicated uh, daily by WhatsApp. All these guys seem to have WhatsApp on their phone. And that has become the, the way that I was able to touch base with these guys uh, quickly and efficiently every day, every morning, we'd have a quick, uh, quick WhatsApp message back and forth. And, uh, that's how we knew that the, uh, that everyone was, was doing well. And they had all the information they knew if they should, you know, feel sick, they, they could call 911 or that, uh, and actually, yeah, or that they could call me if they felt they needed medical attention or something was changing. So, uh, that worked, uh, pretty well. In addition, it was very valuable to have been uh, hooked up with the unknown neighbors group here locally because uh, it was very difficult for these workers to fulfill their obligations to report their symptoms to this Arrive Can app, I think. And so the, uh, 
the the worker through the local Kairos uh, unknown neighbors group was able to assist the workers uh, was able to assist the workers in uh, in reporting, and you know it's been they they didn't understand it's been crazy like there's been uh this year in 2021 there's been police showing up at the farm wanting to know where guys are quarantining there's security guards uh with security agencies coming up wanting to know and so you know i i don't even know i don't even know if those if they went to the holiday inn to check on them actually i see elaine on there maybe sandy would know if i've, I've forgotten to ask the guys if they uh had a visit from the police at the holiday inn or from the security agents at the holiday inn but you know the 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 government has been you know, attempting to uh, to check up on this to make sure everyone is quarantining properly. But, um, you know, it was a great relief to these guys to know, to have someone to communicate with that, yeah, no, listen, you're not going to jail because of this. Because if you listen to the, you know, the, the phone call from uh, from the government of Canada, it'll say failure to report might result in fine or jail time or whatever. So we were able to reassure them that no, 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 just because you don't uh, report to your what's uh, arrive can app, you know, you are not going to, you're not going to be sent back to Mexico or there's not going to be repercussions for you. They can they couldn't seem to understand that, um, you know, government's trying their best at this, but it's all, it was all still rather and st remains still uh, rather mixed up in, you know, how the government has been attempting uh, to, to keep this all organized and, and under control. So, um, you know, and, and, you know, that being said, uh, you know, the rest of it within our plan has been pretty much the same this year. We, we, uh, make an attempt to have the guy, the guys, uh, work in cohorts. They travel in cohorts as much as possible. Uh, they have, we came up with a plan, you know, there was a whole big deal last year about workers rights being denied because farmers were were saying uh that guys couldn't go into town to go grocery shopping so in other words they brought the grocery stores to the farm and said listen let's everybody stay on the farm and let's and let's stay safe so um you know but i guess that came out to be human rights violation we in a pandemic we can't all decide to stay on the farm and stay safe for everyone's good. So, so what we decided to do this year in talking with the guys, we've made an arrangement. I'd, I said, guys, the stores aren't open. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing to do in Barry. Um, you know, traditionally on a Friday night, they'd go shopping, they'd eat at the Chinese buffet, have a nice <laughs> meal cooked at a restaurant that they'd, they'd, you know, go shopping at whatever, Walmart or whatever. Uh, but you know, stuff was closed. There was big lineups. So what they've decided to do is apart from the guys that drive themselves into the, uh, they, some guys have driver's licenses and they drive themselves to do their banking and their, well, their banking, we've, we've switched to all online. They don't have to go to the bank anymore. We do direct deposits and there's no need to go to the bank. So really all they need to do is grocery shopping and any other personal affairs that they need to do. But what they've decided, what we've decided together as a group is in order to minimize the risk, they know, they know now that they're safe here on the farm. They all know have had several negative COVID tests. They're working outdoors in their cohorts, right? If they're ever working indoors or around the Mexican or around our Canadian staff, they've got all the proper protective equipment that they need. So they realize that they're safe here and they realize that the greatest risk is not on the farm here it's in town it's in barry when they're interacting with the canadian citizens so they've come up with ways that they only really go into town every other week you know to do their grocery shopping everybody doesn't go every week because we've decided that at least at this point it's not a good it's not a good risk right and of course they know that when they go into town that's the most dangerous time for them and so they are certain to wear proper protective equipment and we have hand sanitizer in the cars and we say, guys, keep your space, keep your space, because that is where the risk is not working amongst each other here in the field, in the fresh air and far apart most of the time. Right. So 
Uh, so, so far, that's kind of how we have handled it here. And uh, I don't know if it's been good luck or good management, but we've been fortunate and able to uh, keep everyone, everyone safe, uh, everyone safe so far. But uh, yeah, I, I'm listening to all this. That's uh, that's that's my question. So I have responsibilities, clearly, yes. But do I have any rights? And do workers have any responsibility when they come on to my farm, my property, to work? Do they have any responsibility to help keep me and my family safe? I don't know. That's maybe how I'd ask it. I hope to. I hope to learn. I hope to learn that through this, perhaps today. Thanks very much, uh, Maurice. And um, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Vicky, Vicky French. Is that how you pronounce your name, Vicky? Hi, yes, it's Vicky French. <laughs> Thanks so much again, Vicky, for um, agreeing to come and, and, and speak with us and share your, your information with us. Um, Vicky is the manager uh, of Cookstown Greens Certificate Organic Vegetable Farm. I understand, uh, I think Vicky was saying you have about 10 people working with you this time. Um, but any other information you want to share with us, uh, you, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, our, our experiences are very similar to Morris's. However, we uh, employ just a small fraction of what uh, Berry Hill Farms does. So with our guys um, last year, when, um, when the virus hit its peak at the end of uh, March, beginning of April, we only had three guys, but we were expecting two more. Those two guys were delayed until the end of April. Um, and again, everything was so new and unknown to us. Um, here on the farm, we have three accommodations. We have a, a house and two other trailers. So we knew immediately that we'd have to open up that one trailer much earlier in the season to accommodate for the 14 day um, quarantine. Um, and having em employed um, the same guys year after year, um, we do have a relationship with them and it was easy to communicate, you know, what groceries they needed, um, anything to make them feel comfortable over, over the 14 days. We increased our internet usage, things like that, just to kind of ease into those uh, 14 days. Um, after those two guys came out, um, at the end of April, the next three months were absolutely ridiculous. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that we had here was the lack of communication and the delays um, of our guys coming from Mexico. Like nobody had any answers. What we understood was that um, the offices in Mexico were shut down. So it did uh, cause a bit of uh, a delay in last season's crops, but we may do and um, here we are in 2021 and we have a better, better handle on everything. Uh, we're more prepared. Uh, at the end of last season, what we had decided with our 10 guys is that we would uh, stagger their arrivals to accommodate for the 14 day quarantine. So there was no overlap. So when we had three guys come this past January, then we had one guy come in February, two guys come in March, two guys come in May, and then we have two guys coming in June. Um, so it's easy to, to accommodate their quarantine. And we also have um, a smaller trailer here on the farm to, to which we do call the quarantine, the isolation trailer. So we had, uh, th so then that we made that work. And then um, same with Morris, we are guys at the, at the beginning of the pandemic, it would either be myself or my husband, Mike, and we would take one guy and then we would shop for everybody. And then as things kind of eased a bit in the summertime, we would take all the guys um, and we would only take them shopping every other week, which we actually have maintained uh, this year with with them and we have a, a gal from Brad who you know all the Mexican goodies and um, things things that would uh, make them feel at home um, what else 
yeah, we met with like the health unit to check out the accommodations last year and this year uh, to make sure everything um, was uh, top notch for the guys. Um, and lucky enough, this year, each guy has their own bedroom. So I think they kind of like that after years, years prior having to share a room with somebody. Um, we also stagger their shifts. So um, with our eight guys now and two guys coming, we have them start their day an hour before any of our Canadian staff do. So then it gives Mike and I an opportunity to go over their schedule. And then throughout the morning, uh, we employ about anywhere between six and eight Canadian gals. And then their shifts are also staggered. Um, and then the uh, our Mexicans, they have their break and they have their lunch in their trailers as well. And we've got an endless supply of PPE. Um, Connie and Sandy were kind enough to drop off um, additional PPE to what we already have here on the farm for the guys. Um, what else? We, with the guys in, in quarantine and what we're expecting throughout the month of June and one guy in July, WhatsApp is definitely the way to go to communicate with the guys, uh, making sure if there's anything else uh, that they need, additional top-up groceries. Um, and then obviously making sure that we continue to follow all um, government, provincial, municipal little guidelines, because us being in Simcoe County here. And what else? Yeah, um, since, um, since the beginning of the pandemic, and especially in 2021, we've only had one integrity uh, commissioner come by, and he hey is so and so here on the farm um can i see him and so i had to call ruben to the door of the trailer because the uh, integrity commissioner just wanted to see that there was that one worker although two workers arrived at that same time but he just it was very random unexpected but that was the only time in the past uh last year and this year that we had anybody ever come by to check in on our guys um, a very similar story to what Morris mentioned about like a, a Canadian worker. We had like a neighborhood farm gate customer ask us how we were going to keep like everybody else safe. And I basically had to draft, um, you know, a very uh, diplomatic letter. And it's everybody's responsible to everybody's responsibility to be safe. And in the letter, I basically said, I expect my Canadian staff to be just as mindful and um, and safe in their in their daily lives, right? Um, so yeah, we've had uh, we've had some challenges, but I think we're hopefully going to come out of this on the positive side. So um, the one question I did ask um, I did ask Morris in the chat. Uh, he had access to the rapid test kits. And we, I just want to know how we, if he, if he has a contact, which he can share at another time, because we do find like with the switch health, um, we have a direct uh, a lady that we call and we say, hey, approaching, you know, day seven, day, day nine, day 10, let's get planning. And we have a guy that comes to the farm to do the tests rather than having to mail them in. But th that, that extra step would be extremely helpful. Um, I'm just looking at the talk. What PPE equipments are you including? Um, so we have like our gloves um, because here on the farm, we do a lot of microgreens and root vegetables. So we have like gloves, we have aprons, we have like armbands um, and the masks and such. And our migrant workers don't work with our Canadian workers. So right now, for example, the guys are in the field, they're covering lettuce beds or they're seeding or they're planting onions. And then the uh, six gals that I have right now, they're down in our main packing shed, uh, packing vegetables. So we, uh, we're, we're, we can social distance everybody here on the farm. Um, I hope that answered that. I did take some notes. Um, and then the only thing that I would mention if it could be extended to somebody is we found that um, when we met with the health unit to discuss housing, there was like a lot of uncertainties, like, is this going to be um, in place for next year? Or um, how long, you know, you know, this bedroom once used to bunk two guys, at what point 
can we put two guys back in this bedroom type of thing? And it wasn't even a bunk bed. It was like two beds, you know, across the bedroom type of thing. Um, we just wanted to know things like that. Um, I think that's it. Um, from our experiences here at Cookstown Greens with, um, with, our, with our staff, both our migrant workers from Mexico and our Canadians. Hey, thank you so much, Vicky. Really appreciate um, all of your presentations and the information that you share. Um, I think I will open at this time uh, for questions. Valerie, do you have a question? No, I was just, uh, I guess, interested in Morris's question about, it is, it is a good question in terms of, it's very tricky when the source <laughs> of the risk is people. It's not, you know, the hazard is, that, so we're protecting people but they're also the source of the hazard. So how, how do you protect everyone on your farm from the people that are going off your farm? So you know what, you know the circumstances of what's happening on your farm generally, but you don't know for the local um, uh, workforce, which is, which is the case for most workplaces, that they don't know what's happening. So that's where the screening and the education, I guess, and the risk assessment and the cohorting, what you're doing, I think are, are uh, are the so the rights are uh, of the employers are uh, I guess are the ways that you can educate and screen and and um, implement administrative controls that reduce the risk of mixing the mixing workers uh, I think but it is a, it is a it, it's a challenge I think um, and and definitely Last year, at the very beginning, uh, you know, more sort of this, the concern, the instinctive concern was was uh, local local people in Ontario were concerned about wor workers, international workers, bringing the disease. And when we recognized that it was more prolific here, and the risk was to the workers from from the level of circulation in Ontario, and uh, I think that's. Um, and now it's a concern um, in both directions, but there's so much management of the of the incoming with you know with all the structure around the quarantine and all that. So I'm not sure that's an answer, but I, I guess that's uh, the the reason employers are under the Health and Safety Act, given the uh, the the duties and the responsibilities, is because they're deemed to be the people that control the work and control the where the money goes in the organization um, so that they um, but I appreciate um, that actually you're not always in control I think so it's a good it's a good point I'm I didn't I'm Val Wolf I work with Eduardo at Oka when we when we were thinking about this uh, webinar we we were obviously thinking in terms of the rules and the regulations and the legislation and uh, everything that is in place that each and every one of us need to need to uh, adhere to and to observe and to follow and so on. And with that understanding, that is 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 you know we 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 are all in this together. And what what I do will affect others. But it's that level of education and information sharing that I think that, that you uh, alluded to, which is very important, right? That conversation. And of course, I mean there are clearly there are uh, some very specific responsibilities on the part of the employers and on the part of the employee. Uh, but as long as there is that uh, mutual understanding that uh, we all need to play our, our part uh, in terms of keeping um, everyone safe. I think that's the more or less the spirit of, of in which the, 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 um, the webinar was um, <clears throat> organized. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, I see Dorothy's hand uh, up. Dorothy, go ahead. Yeah, um, so, I've been doing health and safety for a long time and actually was a, uh, worked for the Manitoba government at one point um, as something called an occupational hygienist, uh, which means I would have been out enforcing the law uh, if I was allowed to uh, and still working for the Manitoba government uh, at this time. But so one thing I think in terms of Morris, uh, or should I say Maurice, uh, in terms of your uh, question, um, is that I think that it's really hard these days for employers to get um, information that um, that helps you figure out what it is you're supposed to be doing. 
And, and so if you have a right, I would think one of it is to, you know, to, to be able to count on things like the government and the enforcement agencies and the other agencies you're dealing with to get good, accurate information from them so that you know what you can do um, in terms of the question you posed about uh, the folks who are coming to work on the farm but not living there. Um, and uh, that there needs to be, you shouldn't have to make up those rules. It should be sort of same rules pretty much for everybody. Um, and uh, I was really pleased to hear that you're doing that sort of those different kinds of rapid testing and then following up and um, that, that uh, it seemed like you were getting some good support to be able to do that. But um, I think that there's been a lot of confusing information uh, given out particularly during the, uh, uh, this pandemic. Um, and for those of us in occupational health, one of the big frustrations is that um, long before this and certainly in other uh, epidemics, we've known that viruses like this mostly go through the air. And what's happened th through the public health authorities is that they have, um, they're sticking to there, it's, it's droplet, we need to worry about surfaces and the air stuff isn't uh, quite so important is what they've been saying at a fairly often. Although most of them have changed their minds, including the Public Health, uh, Public Health Ontario. The unfortunate thing is that they haven't changed the, um, their recommendations and guidelines and enforcement stuff around what kind of protective gear is needed as a result of that. And they're still really uh, stuck on cleaning and disinfecting. Disinfecting really, as I said in the, the chat, really is unnecessary unless people have been sick. Uh, soap and water will disable the virus. A lot of disinfectants really are pretty nasty. You can give people asthma and things like that. So um, if you have to use them, there are less toxic products out there. So I think that that's one of the things that's been confusing for folks is sort of, you know, it's, it's this droplet stuff and you only need to worry about six feet. Whereas if it's in the air, you've got to worry about the air. And if you're in enclosed uh, quarters, whether it's a packing shed or a bunkhouse, um, unless you're cohorting people and got other things going on, people are sharing the air. And if somebody's sick, it's, you know, the virus can be in the air for quite a while. Um, and, uh, you know, these barrier face coverings and stuff really won't stop uh, people inhaling all the virus that might be there. So um, if you're interested more in that, there's, we've got a variety of materials around it and been doing some uh, webinars about it. Um, but uh, so I think that that whole thing about, you know, how are we getting information and, and where are employers able to get good information from is really important. Um, you know, it's because uh, if you and your supervisors are responsible for making sure that folks who work for you have the straight goods, you need to get them to. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Anybody else? Any questions? Um, I want to actually answer Vicky's question. She mentioned something about housing and when we'd be mm -hmm. able to share, put people back together and, you know, go back to, I guess, normal. And the biggest thing that that's reliant on is two things, uh, case counts and then the amount of people vaccinated. So once we see cases going down, the first dose increasing and then also the second dose increasing, that's when public health in general will start listing different public health measures, including masks, social distancing, and opening up the province again. So I, I'm not sure, like I can imagine but probably by September, based on the way public health has outlined vaccination um, rollout, that probably by September, October, those types of measures will start being listed because a lot more people will have their second uh, dose. So that's kind of um, what that would be based on. Thank you, Mabra. Any other questions? Anybody? Comments? I did put the comment in the chat. I think both, uh, both, uh, uh, more sorry, Vicky, that, you know, the level of communication with the workers and among the workers and in the joint problem solving aspect, that is the basis of the health and safety legislation too. That's the idea is to talk about hazards and solve them together and communicate if you have a concern and, 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 uh, and figure things out together. Even the work refusal process is really meant, it, 
if, if you're communicating, you should never get to a work refusal because you're dealing with the hazard as it arises and you're, you're talking about possible solutions and you're working, working it out. And in the process, you're communicating about the risk or educating about the risk so that it, it, you know, it relieves um, concern if, if it's more of a concern than a risk, that kind of thing. So I, you know, I, apl I applaud that. And I think that it's a big solution that we try to, um, it seems like it's so obvious, but in fact, it's not, it doesn't always happen when people are busy and, and sometimes there's a language barrier um, and, and sometimes there's other, you know, other things going on or the level of fear is such that people can't, um, can't hear, right? Because when you're really, really afraid, um, you can't actually hear and, and uh, digest things until, until that fear is, um, is diminished, so. I do think that's important and the WhatsApp, you know, the, the dialogue and that kind of thing is really important in checking in, so. I think one thing I maybe meant to mention was that there's an important distinction needs to be drawn between the different streams of the temporary foreign worker program. So I think if you have heard of some of the outbreaks early on that were in <clears throat> Uh, greenhouses, perhaps in southern Ontario, uh, meat packing plants out west. If a foreign worker is coming under the seasonal agriculture workers program, it's my responsibility to provide housing, and the housing is provided at minimal cost. I think they pay two dollars a day for electricity costs if they work four hours a day. So it's all regulated. That housing is inspected by the local health unit and there are guidelines in place with respect to capacities and number of bathrooms and all of that stuff. So the seasonal agriculture worker program has become known kind of as the gold standard of how to run a program compared to other parts of the world where migrants, there are little to no standards in other countries. If you are on the low stream, low skills program, or the, there's, I forget the name of it, but there's a program where employers can have workers arrive with a two year contract. That is completely outside of inspection. The government of Canada, as far as I'm aware, doesn't inspect housing conditions or living conditions. The employer does not have to pay for the transportation of the worker from their home country to Canada. So what happens is labor brokers get involved. Labor brokers promise workers in the in impoverished countries jobs in Canada. They pay whatever they need to pay. They can afford to pay to get to Canada. And then those labor brokers rent them houses where the workers are packed in like sardines. And we've seen cases of this where workers working in, like you say, sometimes greenhouses, sometimes meat packing plants, sometimes working cleaning hotel rooms for hotel corporations, there's no oversight on that program. And there, who knows, who knows if it is. And so a lot of these outbreaks, a lot of these outbreaks in those sectors that you hear about, I believe, and I don't have solid data for this, some other government people will have data to indicate that, but that is where the workers are afraid to report. They're afraid of reprisals. They're afraid of all of this. Then what will happen is at the end of the two-year program, they have to have enough money to pay to get back home. And the labor broker, and in the meantime, they're so impoverished, they've, spent, they've sent all their money back home to help their families in their, in their home countries. Now they can't afford to pay for a flight home. They can't get another contract. Where are they going to live? They get a job working for cash somewhere and they're still beholden to their landlord to live in these cramped accommodations and they can't go for health care. They're afraid to come. They're afraid to come out into the public. And so as farmers in the seasonal agricultural worker program, it's uh, discouraging and disheartening for us to be lumped in with this program because they're two distinctly separate and, and opposite programs. And I think if we're a group of uh, seeking social justice and improvements, I think that 
uh, you can always build a better mousetrap. I don't care if it's a seasonal agriculture worker program or not, but I think if you want to go for the low hanging fruit on ways to protect workers and to ensure more social justice, I think that two year program has much, many more improvements that could easily be made. And instead of, yeah, is, is there going to be farm employers in the seasonal agriculture worker program that don't treat their workers properly? Absolutely. And th that shouldn't be allowed, clearly. But I don't think that the percentage of poor employers in that sector would be any different than a poor employer in any other sector, right? But I do think that the two-year system has way more room for abuse and and poor outcomes for all concerned, but especially the workers. So I think, anyways, I think that distinction is is important to make between the two streams of uh, workers. So the other one, the other one where it's tough, uh, it's a tough go to is uh, nannies, living caregivers are in that two year program, right? And they can end up in really really tough situations as well, right? But uh, Anyway, I just wanted to, to share that distinction. Thanks very much, uh, Morris um, and everyone. Um, it's getting close to the hour. Um, are there any more questions or reflections? Uh, Vicky posted there a question there that I wanted to check with, with uh, Okao and with Morris, very specifically um, asking about a contact in order to get rapid test uh, kits. Is there any information that you can share with Vicky here or can we follow up after, Eduardo? Oh, sorry. Um, I think maybe maybe uh, Morris has more information around that. We, we're a bit less, and I know Val just mentioned um, maybe the rapid test, but I think- Yeah, Vicky, if you send me an email, I can, uh, uh, I can share my contact information for those rapid tests. It's a bit of a, they don't just send them out the next day. There's a training program that you have to take to know how to uh, administer the test properly and read the results. There's a little learning curve and there's a little online training that you have to take. But uh, once that's done, they'll ship you the, the test kits and, uh, you, know, go for, you know, go from there. Vicky, do you have uh, Morris's um, email? I do not. So if that could be shared, that appreciate that I would appreciate that. And thank I'll you. I'll do it right now. I'll, I'll put it in the thank chat right now. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. I was and there's also a. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Eduardo. Oh, I just was. But it was really interesting, Morris, what you were mentioning in terms of the differences between the both programs and our program. Um, since the beginning of our kind of focus program, working with agriculture workers, we've worked more with the SOP uh, program and now are starting to work with more of the tier program. And it's definitely complicated. You kind of hear different things across experiences of, of workers under both programs. Um, but it's, it's really, you know, interesting to hear kind of your perspective around that difference because it, it does, you know, that's, it's important to consider the differences between both. I, I do find that I was going to ask you and Vicky, if you had any recommendations or or kind of thinking around because like Val said you know it, from hearing both of you speak it's clear that you've you know you've developed a really good workplace culture where you know you're you're talking you're you're problem solving you're you're listening and I'm just wondering if do you have kind of recommendations for other workplaces that might really be looking to figure out how to establish a bit of that because like Val said you know that avoids you know or you know that resolves and and workers have you know, ability to talk about their concerns and then it all kind of plays out really well. Or do you see kind of something that's changed or, or something you've done differently that, that really has helped that? So in having um, only been um, running the farm for nine years and having managerial experience in other jobs and such, I would like my employees to be a reflection of myself. So in order to create a cohesive like work environment, it starts from me and Mike. So in the way we lead and the way we work and the way um, just like kind of who we are as people. So I think for Mike, because he is with the guys day in and day out, and we only have like eight guys right now and two more guys, they really respect that. And 
Um, it then makes, you know, when we do have to deliver a message or have an important meeting, then it we get more of a reciprocated response from the guys. Also, um, making sure that um, I found since um, the beginning, so nine years ago, that I want the guys to also be part of a cohesive team. So um, for us here with the, um, you know, our, our tasks are rather tedious and they are repetitive, but making sure that all the guys have a fair amount of time doing that same task. So no one guy is then doing that exact same task. And it's taken nine years to do that. And we look at what tasks we have on the board for today and tomorrow and the weekend and the season and making sure all those tasks are shared equally among the guys. So then there's no animosity. And that was changed like immediately um, when Mike and I came aboard, making sure we have like when we wash leafies that it's a shift. So, you know, two guys are on Friday, two guys are on Saturday and two guys are on Sunday and there's no, it's not the same guys. So it's, it's, it's hard work creating that. Right. Um, and you hope that it gets better year after year. And um, also for us, like I know it can be hard not having like a foreman or a leader amongst the migrant workers. Um, and I know there's times there, oh, we wish we had one, but I think that then, um, that then there is no animosity amongst the guys, right? Then everything is, and we do have, we have two guys that have been um, with Cookstown Greens for 15 years. And then other guys over the past five years are new guys, right? So when we get new guys, and like last year, we got three new guys. And this year, I think we're getting two new guys, pairing them up with a veteran guy. Um, but yeah, and then and then just keeping the lines of communication open. So, um, you know, making sure that they can come to Mike and I if they have a problem or a question. Um, I know at the very beginning when you have new guys, one of the things is like, how do we, you know, how can we send money back home? Or like, you know, like Morris said, you know, having access to like a Mexican restaurant. So then they feel comforted, right? Because we're all human beings. And like when we set up the housing, you know, making sure that we have, you know, enough blankets and like, oh, guys, did you, is, do you have enough food? Um, do you have enough groceries, right? Because uh, I could only imagine what it would be like to be in quarantine for, for those 14 days. And just showing them that you care goes a long way. And the there is obviously the language barrier where, you know, speaking with the Canadian girls, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, oh, you know, you, you know, you living safely. Oh, you know, where, what have you been up to? You know, just kind of asking those key questions to making sure everybody's living mindfully um just those those other gestures uh extending to the guys just make you know shows that you care too but yeah it's taken years to create a more harmonious culture because they do tell us stories of other farms that they worked at and they were not pleasant work conditions so but yeah it's you know every season we hope that it's better for the guys and that systems are more efficient for them and that then they want to come back and work and work for Mike and I. I hope that I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, that's great. Yeah. No, thank you so much, uh, uh, Vicky and Eduardo and Morris and, and Mavra. Uh, I've learned quite a bit, and I hope that everybody else who was here with us, uh, you know, uh, learned a little bit of uh, something that they didn't know before. Um, I'm glad to hear from some of you that um, you know you feel better this year than. You know, obviously, compared to next year, uh, to last year rather, um, obviously we've learned a little bit. You know how to deal with with this uh, pandemic. Um, there's a little bit more information. Obviously, there are still challenges, right? Um, but that's part of the idea of having these uh, webinars and, and this type of program, so we can find ways of uh, supporting one another, preparing ourselves to to help. Uh, um, the community as well to keep everybody safe. And when I say community, I'm definitely um, including, um, you know, migrant workers, uh, farmers, uh, and the community at large, because we are all we are all living here, and the, uh, we all need for one another. Um, let me see. Uh, I also uh, wanted to check. Um, so, Vicky, you will get that information from Morris, but I think Dorothy was saying that it will be 
uh, useful to have that information as well about the rapid test uh, kits uh, with everyone. So I'll find out with maybe Shannon and, and um, uh, Connie how we can get uh, some information or, or resources that, you know, to, to the list. So we have your emails and we're going to do some follow up and, and share that information with, with, with you as well. I, I don't want to put uh, Morris's contact uh, on the spot, you know, that everybody's going to have it. Uh, but at least the two of you can communicate and, and uh, for Dorothy's question, because it, it might involve more than just one contact, right? I mean, you had to think in terms of, you know, regional, I think uh, was, I don't know if it was Valerie or Dorothy, but somebody post, posted in the chat there that uh, the local chambers, uh, that was Valerie, uh, local chambers of commerce had some um, kits to deploy with people, employers who have less than 50 employees. So we'll share that info and um, we'll do some follow-up. If you don't hear from us, uh, you have our emails. Um, uh, Shannon, myself, uh, Connie, Cheryl, uh, and so on. Um, you can contact us. Uh, before I uh, do a thank you or you know, a closing thank you to each and every one of you, want to check one more time. Eduardo, is your, your hand is still up. Uh, that that was a mistake. Sorry about that. I'll put it down. No, no, it's all right. I just want to make sure. Uh, yeah, I want to thank each and every one of you for um, taking the time to 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 share with others. I really appreciate. Uh, again, the, the we know that the challenges are ongoing, uh, but this is what the work that we continue to do, and hopefully, we will continue to support one another. I heard Eduardo at the beginning said, uh, you know, you don't know um, Morris or Vicky, but now you know each other. Uh, but OCAS resources and information are also available to employers. So hopefully you'll be doing cross, cross uh, reaching out uh, and um, helping one another. I think that the information that, that we all have, the more we share it, the, the better equipped each and every one will be, including workers. So thank you so much. And unless there is any pressing matter or question, I would like to bring this to a closure and uh, without, uh, I don't want to forget that the next um, webinar is on the 15th, June the 15th, and that is going to be the screening. Granted that there are no, and there are no issues preventing us from showing the, the, the film, uh, the film Migranta will be uh, screened on June the 15th. It's a 25 minute video that follows the lives of uh, three uh, female migrant workers. And, um, we will use that as a you know, uh, starting point for a, a discussion in terms of a, uh, what, you know, how the issues that the, the film uh, um, highlights, how are these issues uh, magnified with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, issues of isolation, uh, you know, and, and so on. So for communication, for sure. Uh, but more than that, uh, the, the, the film focus on gender related issues as well, because it does focus on how uh, the, the whole process of, uh, you know, going to another country, how does that impact on um, female workers. So I'll invite you all to, to hopefully we'll see you on the 15th. And with that, I want to thank you and uh, have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Take care.